Um, so thanks for the extra time, folks, for uh, getting set up here. Um, we are uh, today going to be building on some of our discussions from last time, uh, or covering uh, some material on, on one of the types of major types of modeling we'll be discussing this term, which is system dynamics modeling. And uh, for this lecture, as in subsequent lectures, we're going to be uh, have attendance from some remote individuals here. Um, there's a couple of them logged in now, and uh, I'm going to listen for a little beep from my computer, which will indicate they've raised their hand to ask a question. So um, if you folks hear anything, and I don't seem to, let me know if this thing, this thing beeps, okay? Um, but uh, for right now, I'm just going to start up our recording here, and then I'm going to go over to our um, uh, to our PowerPoint, get that fired up, and I'm going to switch it so that they can they can see it. Okay. Um, so to do that, I just go over here and we'll share that particular application. Okay. Here we go. Boom. Okay. Um, so uh, last time we had discussed, um, in addition to sort of administrative view about the course structure and a um, little bit of a, of a hint of motivations. We talked some about the, the modeling process on a larger scale, the steps we go through. Can anyone remind me here, um, what are some of those steps that we go through um, when we wish to uh, build a, a model, a model of, of some problem that concerns us? What are some of the essential Okay, problem conceptualization, which maps on to, um, to requirements. Um, okay. um, maps on to requirements um, uh, for, for software. Um, uh, what's another stage we go through? That's arguably the most important, because that, after all, deals with the issue of what it is we want to build. What is it we're trying to characterize? And, and how, what, what set of things are we going to consider in that characterization? What's another thing? Another stage we have to go through. Uh, okay, so a model formulation often consists of, of uh, identifying values for model parameters, particularly quantitative assumptions that are captured in that model. It also involves specifying constitutive relationships, um, as they might be termed in applied math. Uh, things that, that relate one factor in the model to another, that specify if you change this, how does this other thing change? Okay. We're going to start to see um, at a semi-quantitative level how we can start to specify those today. Um, we're going to be going on to specifying them in a very unambiguous way in, in some coming sessions. Okay. So those are relationships among factors. Other things specified there will be initial conditions. Okay, um, what are some other stages that we might go through to develop, um, develop a model that we actually feel good enough about that we could, we could use it for guidance or turn to it for, for helping give insight? Calibration. Calibration. So there we often will have a set of data that speaks to about the behavior of the system as a whole, and we'll try to make the model, make sure the model accords with that data courts as closely as possible, given our uncertainties. Um, there's some further stages, model testing, for example, um, adaptation of the model to be used by stakeholders by providing with a rich interface. All of these are, are stages which apply to multiple sorts of dynamic modeling, modeling where we're simulating things over time. And again, in this class, we're going to see three types. System dynamics modeling first, starting today, agent-based modeling, which is going to form the plurality of the course, and uh, discrete event modeling, which we'll be, all be also talking about in a few lectures. Okay. Um, so today we're going to be uh, speaking about the, the first of these types of uh, system dynamics modeling. And, you know, there's, there's many, um, uh, many different ways that I could start to present it. But I thought I'd, I'd begin by sort of giving a little bit of an overview, a flavor of it. And then we'll dive into some of the specifics, okay? Um, uh, so this will help orient you as to sort of the why and the, um, 
and, and give a picture as to sort of where this might be going, how the different pieces fit together. So what is system dynamics? System dynamics is a feedback oriented perspective on problems, okay? So it's, it centers around feedbacks, situations where a change within the system leads to a cascading series of changes that ripple around and either reinforce that original, that original disturbance or push back against it. And there's many types of feedbacks that we encounter in the world. Um, and system dynamics focuses on um, feedback based a feedback orientation to give us insight into how a system's behavior might evolve. We'll talk about some of the feedbacks we regularly encounter, but can anyone suggest to me uh, where a feedback might occur in our daily life? We go through our lives living precisely because of feedback. That's one hint. Can anyone give some examples? Hormones? Yes, hormonal system, right. So. Um, and that operates at a whole bunch of different levels. Uh, for example, you eat, the feeling of satiety, the feeling of feeling full, is a function of several hormones in the body, I believe involving leptin and others. And, and at some point we eat, we start to feel full, and therefore we stop eating at some point. Absent that, um, we, would, we would have very undesirable <laughs> consequences probably wouldn't be able to live. What's a, and, and by the same token, that, lep, that same hormone is involved in stirring up feelings of hunger. So if we need food, we start to feel hunger. And then we can go undertake actions, various sorts that will secure for us that nutriment. Okay, what's, a, what's another feedback? So that's a great example. How about something very similar, a physiological feedback associated with another critical body process? Temperature regulation, great. Um, so our body has ways, if its temperature goes out of whack, to regulate that. So if your temperature goes too high, you what? Sweat, for example. That's, that's one way, right? Um, if your temperature goes too low, well, one way it tries to deal with that is by shivering. To try to generate a little bit of heat. Um, there's other mechanisms as well. Um, thirst, another obvious, obvious mechanism. Um, uh, mechanisms throughout our lives associated with that. And they're not just physiological, there are also mm -hmm. mechanisms involving our, our um, conscious activities. So we're, if we drive between here and Regina, we may know the road well, but there's a constant process of feedback going on where if we notice our car veering off in one direction, another we correct for it. Right? Those are regulatory feedbacks. There's other types of feedbacks that are quite unstable. Those regulatory feedbacks keep us keep us, uh, keep the situation under control, keep the situation in balance in some sense. And there's this whole process called homeostasis that governs our lives, that, that helps, us, helps us live, stay alive, and helps animals, you know, and, and eat plants, um, uh, you know, with the, the essential balance required for living. Um, there's also unstable feedbacks, feedbacks which can go quickly out of control or which can quickly take off. Feedbacks associated with sales, for example. So if you have a popular app that you've uploaded to the app store and it starts to take off, people talk about it. And that may lead to more people buying it. And those people will talk to let m yet more people and there's a takeoff associated with that. In that case, it might be called a virtuous feedback. It's reinforcing each little change initially. That initial person stirs up a larger change and a larger change and a larger change. Um, and companies owe much of their ability to innovate and to quickly move through positive feedbacks like that. But there's very deleterious feedbacks too. Situations that we term uh, a vicious cycle. Situations where you know, people um, lose uh, the ability to, uh, to function in, in their lives, uh, perhaps due to an addiction, and the addiction leads to inability to get a job, which leads to even more despair and even more reliance on that addiction. There's vicious cycles like that. There's vicious cycles associated with poverty, etc. And there's vicious cycles associated with organizational dysfunction. How about in software projects? For those of you from computer science background, um, what would be a vicious cycle that might apply in a software project that could lead to things go more and more out of control? 
well, how to put projects behind and a manager starts to really put down the screws on the people in the project you know it's time to uh, uh, time to work longer hours and so on how might that lead to a set of changes which end up even worsening the situation Boom. And, and what's particularly pernicious about that is initially it may look like people are being more productive. After all, they're, in the hour, they're spending the extra hours, the code is getting written, but there's this undiagnosed set of bugs piling up, this kind of deferred set of work that's being created, all this extra work. And people get fatigued as well. But not only that, people start to leave. And when people leave, they take knowledge with them and it takes time to hire a new person and you have to train the new person. And this can lead to projects going terribly off track, terribly off track. Fred Brooks, in, in his book, The Mythical Man Month, talks about this in spades. Adding new people to a late project tends to make it later. Mm -hmm. That's an example of a vicious cycle. Okay? So feed, um, it turns out that these, that these uh, feedbacks have a um, quite significant impact on system behavior. And in fact, they're what allow the system to sort of maintain some stasis or move to some point. They tend to dominate system behavior at some point. System dynamics focuses on them because they play such a large role in the dynamics of the system. But in addition to being a, a uh, feedback-oriented perspectives, it's, it's an evolving methodology which helps conceptualize, describe, analyze, and especially manage complex systems. So it's, it's aimed not merely to analyze or to understand, but to help guide us as to how we can manage these more effectively. And uh, system dynamics as a, as a methodology offers a, a set of characteristics that um, distinguish it from actually the other two modeling methodologies we'll be talking about here in class. And they include both a qualitative and quantitative side. And we'll see today some of the qualitative side, which can be very powerful and very, uh, very um, uh, broad in its reach. In other words, people build these sort of models at a qualitative level with absolutely no background in, um, in quantitative simulation, no course like this under their belt. But it also includes a really, really rich quantitative component as well. Um, quantitative component that is amenable to rich sets of analysis. And this quantitative component is based on something called ordinary differential equations, which some of you will be familiar with because it's a, it's a mainstay for characterizing continuous system behavior for many areas of applied math and engineering, et cetera. Okay. Um, so it's based, based on what are called state equations. And some will have uh, had courses which expose you to it's also a, a defined incremental and iterative methodology that, that seeks to deliver value to stakeholders throughout the process. Um, it seeks to deliver to, to those sponsoring a project or those uh, motivated to start a project insights throughout the entire process. Not just when the model's built, not just when the final simulation model is built, but from the very get-go give ongoing insight. Um, and uh, to help stir that up, there's time home techniques for working with diverse interdisciplinary stakeholders. Now it turns out there's some quite evolved software, um, uh, software which was very forward thinking and using declarative techniques, which really characterize what is being described, hide the details of how it's realized, and use what are called generative software techniques to actually realize the how and run the system um, so that the person using it has, has no sense they're doing programming. Just as with a spreadsheet, you have no real sense you're doing programming when you put those formulas in. Now behind it is a whole infrastructure based on DAGs, directed acyclic graphs, based on algorithms for updating these things, a whole set of, of algorithms that make that possible. But from the point of view of the people using the model and the point of view of the person using the spreadsheet, um, these things are all done behind the scenes and they can focus on describing the problem of interest. They can focus on thinking about it at a domain level, characterizing it, 
rather than worrying about software engineering. Okay? And it turns out that's a, that's a very powerful vision, and it's realized quite well in system dynamics. Um, it does, however, have a really rigorous mathematical foundation. And some people within the field, including myself, um, have done quite a lot to, to use this mathematical um, foundation. So I've got a question here, it looks like. And um, yes, Neil. Uh, so there was a, uh, okay, uh, audio seems to be garbled. Okay. Um, uh, okay, I'm going to try adjusting the volume here. Let's see if this uh, helps a bit. Give it another minute and I'll come back, okay? Um, appreciate you showing that to me. Okay, so there's a, there's a rich mathematical foundation um, under, on top of which this is built and a set of analysis tools that, that are very powerful for building quantitative models. Um, and then there's a, a set of techniques for interfacing with cognate areas. Um, Techniques for building in parameter estimates, for example, doing calibration to other sets of data. And it can be readily used with evidence-based practices from other areas like meta-analysis. So for those whom that's a meaningful statement, um, uh, there's some very nice examples of system dynamics models that have made use of, of, of meta-analysis. Um, okay, so one of the things I'm going to ask you to realize in this course, and this is a, a more general point that that applies to much of um, much of uh, sort of considerations uh, more broadly among methodologies is that often modeling methodologies, um, while they focus on building dynamic models, simulation models, they're distinguished more fundamentally by the questions being asked than by the answers being given. Okay, so what you'll see is that system dynamics tends as a methodology, as an approach to articulate different questions and to try to answer different questions than we'll say agent-based modeling or than we'll discrete event modeling. They have different foci, different things that they're trying to elicit. People like ourselves often get caught up in the mathematics and the formalisms and, and sort of um, how they're characterizing the situation and their differences there. But the more fundamental difference is what questions are they trying to answer? And that ends up shaping, in a major way, how they represent things, okay? And, and we'll see this. Um, so the methodologies are often distinguished most distinctly in the way in which they frame problems. And, and comparing them, we have to be conscious of these. Okay, so let me, let me go back to our remote uh, folks here. Um, so Neil, um, how is the, the audio now? Is it any better? Can you... Uh, can you um, uh, press a, it could be something on your side. In other words, it could be your network. I'm not sure. Maybe you can see from other participants if they're facing something similar. Uh, Neil, could you type anything regarding the audio? Maybe you can't understand it. Um, <laughs> okay, so we're going to have to bear with this. Um, I'll, I'll come back to that. Okay, so, so system dynamics is very focused on the broader human theater of system dynamics modeling. By human theater, I mean it's, it's something which consciously is aware that um, modeling is a human process and that it exists not in a vacuum where the model springs full blown with, uh, in, in a totally finished state. It, it comes out of a human process of discussion and it serves a function within the broader human purpose. And one of my colleagues, Peter Hoffman, uh, of the Washington University in St. Louis, has a very nice little illustration of this where he, he talks about how system dynamics is used to address different types of problems. And um, some of them involve sort of more of a focus on an objective view of the world, the way things are out there, and sort of incremental change. So here, for example, we lead to, we seek to try to estimate how to intervene most effectively or, or seek to better understand why we're seeing a certain pattern. By contrast, there's some, some types of models that will seek to transform, for example, the, um, the healthcare system entirely. Not to examine how things are right now, but how things could be at a much more sort of uh, complete way, um, transforming the feedbacks involved, the flows of information, the ways in which uh, things are, are achieved. 
conversely, there can be some models that focus on more of a subjective view and focus on, on how people think about the situation or how people coordinate with each other. The focus here is not so much on the way things are in the world, but how do people approach these issues? How do they think about it? How do they, how do they work together or work in, at cross purposes in a way that may attain or thwart the goals we're trying to achieve? So s you'll find system dynamics models in all quadrants here. What I want to emphasize here is this, folks, that agent-based models and discrete event models are typically in this quadrant right here this lower right quadrant, okay? They're in this analysis problems type area. System dynamics tends to have models which focus on all these things. And some of the best models are focused on, for example, models to motivate people to work together more effectively by helping them understand how their different roles within a system are interdependent and how, they, how the actions of one affect the actions of others. Um, or affect the, 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 the situation for others. So you'll find models which aren't so much interested in a very detailed description of the world, but they're interested in, in shaping how people think about the world and how, think, how they think about their interactions with other people. And sometimes you'll find people who work in this space over here. I tend to work mostly in this space. A lot of agent-based modelers work in this, in this fourth quadrant down here to the lower right. They tend to, cord to criticize these other models, saying, oh, well, they're overly simplified or they're overly um, uh, simplistic. Um, they don't necessarily correspond to what we see in the world. But that's not the point of them. The point of them is to transform how people think about their own position vis-a-vis -vis others. And so they have a very different goal. Okay? Um, so much of system dynamics is focused on what's called participatory discourse. This is, this is a situation where we are working with the, the group that we're trying to study to try to change people's understanding, to capture their, their conception of the situation, how they conceive of it, regardless of whether or not it's fully true. But by understanding how they conceive of it and how different groups conceive of it, we may be able to identify common ground, for example. Okay? And simulation models can play a role in this. That's the, that's the intriguing thing. Um, and uh, you know they seek a model which is accessible by a broad set of stakeholders. So showing a broad set of stakeholders, say on a, um, say within a long-term care facility or within a within a uh, reserve or you know within a impoverished inner city community in Toronto, showing them a set of Java code for an agent-based model, however rich it is, is just not going to do much for them showing them a very, very simple model that helps them realize the futility of a certain approach that they're adopting and why it might be better to adopt another approach can go a long way. Even if that model is not as detailed as that agent-based model would be, okay? So this is, this is a lot of the focus of system dynamics of changing how people think about the situation. And it makes use of this declarative specification, a, a specification that involves basically no programming as we commonly think about it, and an intuitive graphical representation. And we're going to see this. It's, it's using Benson. Um, uh, what it aims to do is to, um, is to gain high stakeholder involvement um, and model from the very start. So conceptualization, formalization, um, formulation, and analysis. So all those stages that we talked about last time, um, these stages going, going here down um, down here to the right, um, all these stages would be stages stakeholders can be involved within a system dynamics project. Um, often they're engaged in the very first sta state and they're involved all throughout the process. Let me ask this, for those for software uh, from software development, um, uh, where, um, where do you see this sort of um, involvement of stakeholders throughout the process of developing a program. What sort of methodologies encourage that in software development? Anyone tell me? Sorry? So in, in within software development, development of software programs, there are certain types of methodologies, methodologies for building software that encourage stakeholder involvement. Very in fact stakeholder embedding is the type of is the term that's sometimes used throughout the process of developing a program. 
on an ongoing basis meeting with stakeholders every day or maybe every week at most um, to try to engage them in the discussion. What, what sort of process would be involved with that? Anyone say? Well, it turns out extreme programming, for example, as an approach emphasizes this. You have the bullpen, this area where stakeholders meet with their clients or customers users meet with the software developers on an ongoing basis. And this is, is a certain similar flair to it. Um, what we see though is we're going to talk today about causal loop diagrams, which are down here on the lower right. Whoa, um, lower left, sorry. And then there'll be development of stock and flow models. And these stock and flow models will, will be isomorphic with, will be directly mappable to, they are a representation, a visual representation of when they're fully quantified of ordinary differential equations, state variables. So for those for whom that's a meaningful statement, each of these so-called stocks here represents a state variable in a differential equation. In other words, dx dt, it's the x in the dx dt is associated with each of these. And we'll take a look at that, okay? Um, and then some output, comparing it with historical data, and analysis here. And this uses what's called phase plane analysis, state space analysis, a very quantitative analysis because it's based on differential equations. And then often they're wrapped up in these, these uh, interfaces for stakeholders to use, sort of as, which hide the model, okay? Um, and the reflection here is often it's a modeling process, ladies and gentlemen, that offers the greatest value. Even if the model that you're building disappeared at the end of the modeling process. The idea is that within system dynamics, you aim for the people who worked in building that model to have great insights because they were involved in building it, because they were involved in discussing it, because they're involved in, in, in running it. It changed how they think about the situation. That is the emphasis within system dynamics. Okay? Um, and there's kind of this view of modeling as theory building. You're, you're building up a theory, an operational theory, as encoded in the model. The model represents sort of a theory for how the world is, a, a dynamic hypothesis, okay? And so there's a, this whole process of reflecting on mental models, what is and is not known, and, and incorporating different perspectives within this. Um, so there's a variety of reasons that this field has tended to emphasize stakeholder participation within the past few decades. And they include, you know, gathering really grounded understanding of what is going on, not depending on, you know, high level people, experts to summarize it, but really talking to people on the ground about what are the problems they're facing, what do they see, not relying on sort of a lot of secondhand um, analysis. So where possible, interacting with those directly affected, building community capacity to deal with problems, um, helping to have some people who can critique the model as to whether it's it's grounded or not, um, fostering cooperation among the parties. So I was involved early on in my um, in my modeling work with one project that um, ended up changing how the allocation is done for education in Texas, the state of Texas. Essentially, traditionally, the schools, the high schools, and the universities had been at loggerheads, struggling for a given amount of money, and. Uh, the university was upset if the schools got more money because they thought it meant less money for them and vice versa. And after a modeling project that we undertook where we looked at modeling that continuum of students going on from high school going on to university and seeing the amount of work that the university had to do to deal with remedial students, students who, who needed further, further training, this training they should have gotten in high school, they ended up as a group going together to the legislature and saying, look, we need more money for education as a whole. And the universities advocated the high schools get better funded and that the universities, you know, expand their, their charter in a different area. So rather than just doing remedial catch-up work from the kids that are graduating, they could, they could expend those resources in a different way. So they ended up cooperating, groups that had traditionally been budding heads. And that's the sort of goal that a lot of system dynamics projects seek to, to undertake. Um, turns out that involving stakeholders uh, allows for a lot of other things, but um, you know, one of the key things is you get better buy-in. So once you have policy recommendations, people understand where they're coming from. They're not coming from a black box. They're not coming from some egg-headed scientist 
they're coming from a model you helped build, and therefore that has credibility with you. Credibility in terms of shaping, shaping your willing, uh, willingness to kind of invest in, in what it seems to suggest as, as most effective. So within system dynamics, there's a lot of group model building sessions. This is one in, in India that actually took place with rural villagers in India. And these villagers were drawing diagrams of the sort we'll be learning about today with causal diagrams that are the first stage in building up system dynamics models. So, um, you know, uh, there's another group within, this was uh, also in India, another group within um, uh, inner city St. Louis, another group within, um, uh, within uh, Mongolia, etc. cetera. Okay. Um, so I've just given um, an overview here. I think what I'm going to do is, rather than continuing to talk about it, I'd like to talk about this notion of a causal loop diagram, OK? Um, causal loop diagrams being um, the starting point for thinking about the feedbacks of a system, OK? Um, now, uh, to begin this, I, I want to start motivating why we're talking about feedbacks. And for this purpose, I'd like a volunteer. I'd like a volunteer who's willing to get up in front of the class here. Um, and specifically, how many people within this class have ever tried taking a broom or taking a yardstick and trying to balance it like this? Has anyone done that? Anyone think they're pretty good at it? Okay. <laughs> oh, come on. Yeah, yeah. Come on up and try it. Come on up and try it. All um, right. I can see where your participation grade is going. Um, Balancing <laughs> stuff. <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah. So. Hey, pretty good. We're getting this on worldwide video too. Oh yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. Even, like, amp the yeah. Yeah. This is recorded for posterity. Uh, okay. Hey, terrific. Uh, fantastic job. Um, okay. Now, what's going on there, folks? Uh, let me see this this for a moment. I won't hit you with it. Um, so um, when we have this. It, you notice he was moving his finger around. Why was he moving his finger around? Why was he sort of balancing the top of his finger? Why, why did I need to do that? Why, why couldn't I just hold my finger fixed? Yeah, it's unstable. It's unstable. A small deviation from vertical here leads to tilting, which leads to an even stronger acceleration. On There's a positive feedback, a reinforcing feedback that leads it to accelerate downwards. It's unstable in a mathematical sense. For those for whom this is a meaningful statement, the eigenvalues of the system are greater than zero, um, and it exhibits divergent behavior. The trajectory is divergent. A small deviation leads to a larger and larger deviation, even faster deviation. Now, by moving it around, what's happening? What, why do you move it around? Why does that help that? And it, what was guiding your moving it around? Do you want to? So it counters the yeah. force that's happening. Yeah, you're exerting a negative feedback, a regulatory feedback, sort of like what governs our homeostasis, uh, what governs our eating and our drinking, etc. cetera. Um, when we're thirsty, we drink. When you're hungry, you, and when you see this moving one way, you move to counter it. And that negative feedback keeps it more in balance. It keeps it from turning over, right? Um, so what you've just done by doing that is to add a negative feedback that counters this positive one. So adding a feedback there changed the behavior from, you know, quite trivially, you know, being able to topple over in a, in a second to something where you could keep it balanced for a long period of time without this hitting the floor, right? Now, um, suppose you didn't add that feedback. Suppose, uh, why don't you take it now and try balancing it again? And now I'd like you to close your eyes. All right. It's good. All right. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. So, so the eyes were part of that feedback. The eyes were picking up the deviation, right? Um, the fingers did to some degree. The eyes did. And that's what allowed you to kind of figure out how to keep it balanced. So my point here is that feedbacks are, are key to engage to, to achieving stable behavior. Um, we are dealing here with two types of feedbacks, a divergent or unstable a feedback, a, a feedback that's reinforcing, which leads to deviation from the state we're hoping to maintain, and a, and a regulatory feedback, a feedback that's balancing, that seeks to maintain the state where it's 
what will balance over our finger? Um, and by changing the feedback structure, by adding a single feedback, you can you can qualitatively change the stability of the situation. You can qualitatively change your ability to keep this thing in a state that's desirable. And this is one of the big motivations why system dynamics looks at feedbacks. They govern the behavior in a, in a giant way. Okay, I'm all, all set. I appreciate it. Um, much appreciate that. Okay, so um, I don't know if our remote uh, listeners got 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 the eyeful that we all did, but that was a much appreciated demonstration. So we're going to be talking here about causal loop diagrams, a way of, of diagramming out these feedbacks or thinking through the feedbacks associated with the system and thinking through the influences more generally. So what we're seeking to focus on here is causality. Like what changes changes what? Okay, um, and what we're going to see here is a semi-quantitative diagram that emerges. Semi-quantitative because we abstract away from, we hide the details of exactly in a quantitative way how one thing depends on another. But we indicate, ladies and gentlemen, the polarity of that dependence, plus and minus. Okay, um, okay is this uh, uh, someone uh, horning me? No? Um, Oh, okay, okay. Um, I'm sure it's something to offer, but uh, um, so uh, here we have a semi-quantitative background, and it turns out just being able to label polarity will give us great insight. Okay, great insight to possible modes of behavior. So um, I'd like to talk about how we uh, build up these diagrams, and for that purpose, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to actually leave this uh, sort of set of slides just the introduction to system dynamics, which as with all slides, you're welcome to go through in more detail. And now I'd like to go to, um, to a discussion specifically about causal loop diagrams, okay? Um, and uh, per sort of Khan Academy, ooh, it, per Khan Academy, I should be recording. Well, I guess, um, there we go. Um, so uh, maybe you ran out of battery there. Um, so here we have causal loop diagrams. Um, and uh, we're going to be seeing a, a lecture on these. Um, can you folks remotely see the, um, see the slides again? Uh, no, OK, OK. So we'll, um, I'll, I'll refresh the slides here. So let me stop sharing. There we go. And then I will start sharing um, again. And hopefully we will. Okay, here we go. Boom. Okay. Um, so, uh, can you folks uh, see the slides? Uh, see the slides now. Did someone type something. Oh no no. Okay okay. Well, um, let me let me give it one more one more one more try. Okay. Um, Tools, application sharing, search sharing. Okay, yeah, yeah. Um, share. Okay, um, that's great. And okay, I'm, I'm trying to show these slides here. They're the same set of slides that I would have sent to uh, some of you earlier. And uh, just as a as a um, fallback, I'm going to send them to you right 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 now. Um, in case you can't see them on the screen as I'm giving them. Okay, so pardon me, folks, here for just a minute. Uh, 8.58. Uh, we'll try to do this ahead of time from now on. Uh, PDF and causal loop diagrams. There we go. Okay, so um, they're being sent out, and you should get a, a download thing for them in just a minute. Okay? Um, I'll also use the video to, to focus on the, the, the uh, board here so you can see what I'm presenting. So I'm, I'm giving this lecture on, on basics of causal loop diagrams. Um, so um, within a causal loop diagram, we have um, words which represent uh, factors or components, um, variables as we call them. And we have linkages between them, OK? And linkages indicate uh, something. Um, so an arrow with a positive sign from A to B indicates that all other things being equal, an increase in A will tend to lead to an increase in the, in the second variable, in, in B, in other words, compared to what it would otherwise, the value it otherwise would have had. Okay? Um, and if we have a minus sign, 
if you increase A, it will tend to lead to a what in B, do you think? A decrease in B compared to what it otherwise would have been. Note that comment. It's not saying that if you increase A, B will go down necessarily over time. It just, it'll be, it will have, if it's a positive link, if you increase A, it'll make B higher than it otherwise would have been. Um, and if it's a negative link, lower than it otherwise would have been. Um, okay, so, so this is the rules governing two links. Now, by the same token, if we have a positive link from A to B, so A is linked to B in a positive direction, sort of like it is here, um, hunger to food ingested. Here, if we increase A, all of the things being equal, increase our hunger, we'll eat more food. Um, on the other hand, if we decrease our hunger, it tends to mean we'll tend, tend to eat less food than we otherwise would have. Okay? So that's with a positive link. In other words, the changes are in the same direction. Yes? So, uh, Pardon me. In that loop, we found that so all, uh, all of them need to be saved because, as I said, that food in this state is some kind of action. Yeah. And the hunger is in state. Yeah. Right? Um, so the hunger is a state. You could think of it as this represents some a variable sort of representing, you know, sort of the degree to which I am hungry, okay? And here we have a variable, the degree to which I, I'm eating food, okay? Um, and it's true, there's somewhat different semantic kinds in this case. One's an action and one's sort of a state is, I think, what you're saying. That is abstracted over here, okay? Um, we, we, that's not something that's distinguished. We'll see that these diagrams can be elaborated to distinguish more types of things. And that'll be an interesting thing to look at. Right now, I'm just focusing on this, this link here. And the, the thing to note is if you change hunger, all of the things being equal change food ingested in the same direction. Okay? So sometimes this is labeled with an S instead of a plus okay, for same. Similarly, if we have a negative, um, uh, a negative link, they will change in opposite direction. Okay? So if you increase the amount of food ingested, all of the things being equal, it will tend to lower the amount of, of, of hunger. That, that you would have, you have compared to what it otherwise would have been. Okay, um, so in in classic sort of terms of, of uh, multidimensional calculus, um, this this indicates the sign of the of the partial derivative of, of so if x is going has a link to y, partial y partial x is greater than zero has a positive link, less than zero has a negative link. Okay. Um, so it's, bas it's basically indicating that this, this link. So a small change, a small change in y, given a small change in x, will tend to y to be compared to what otherwise would have been um, uh, higher uh, if it's a positive link. OK, so um, any questions about this notion of links? We're going to see lots of examples of this now, and hopefully it will reinforce this, this understanding. OK. Um, Right. Um, so when you when we're going to start putting these things into whole links, whole chains, okay, of 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 links, and a uh, couple tips for this. Um, when you're thinking about the polarity, it's helpful to just reason about the link in isolation. It's going to be part of a big diagram eventually, but think about that link in isolation. Think of the first factor and ask yourself if x. If it's going from x to y, x ask if x were to increase, would y increase or decrease compared to what it otherwise would have been? That's the key question that you're going to be asking about. Um, and and if it's in the same direction, you'll get label with a plus, um, otherwise with a minus. Later, we will see reasoning through the the, the polarity associated with a whole chain of these. And after they're derived for each little subcomponent, but it's important to derive it for the subcomponents first. Okay. Um, it's, it's important to note that we're trying to capture causal influences here. A, the link between A and B, it should not just be they're associated with a higher value of B. It should be if we change it, how does it change B compared to what it otherwise would have been? It's, it's a, it's a, you know, it's a, if you could actually change it. So it's a causal influence, okay? Um, it shouldn't be matter, uh, merely a matter of definition. Um, uh, okay, and I, I distinguished again, we're asking about is it greater, is y greater compared to what it otherwise would have been versus 
change over time. Okay, so let's let's talk about these causal pathways now. So if we build this up from length to length, now we can reason about um, a, a pathway which consists of say two or more such lengths. So A to B, B to C. And the important point here is that each of the, if each of these subcomponents has a has a polarity associated with it, A to B, and then successively B to C, um, that induces an implied link in the relationship between A and B. So if by increasing A, it tends to do what to B compared to what otherwise would have been? Is B higher or lower? If it's a negative link, it's lower than it otherwise would have been. Okay. Um, and if, if I increase A and it leads to B to be lower than I otherwise would have been, how, do, how will that influence the value of C? It will tend to be higher. So there'll be sort of in, in a net terms, increasing A will tend to ripple through and end up increasing C compared to what it otherwise would have been, right? This is key because we're going to get to a situation where A and C end up being the same. There's a loop. Okay. Um, okay. Um, right. So uh, I'll I'll come back to to s some of these points, but um, suffice it to say that we're going to get to a point where we have feedback loops. Okay. Um, uh, where we're going to have a situation where there's um, a path which leads back several links, which lead back to the original one. Okay. So. Here's something that those who start businesses want to see. This is the virtuous cycle I talked about with word of mouth sales and customers up here to the upper right. So if we have an increase in customers, satisfied customers, it leads to more word of mouth sales and therefore more customers. So if we have an iPhone and we're very happy with it, we tell other people, we show it to other people, the iPhone 5 maybe, they go out and buy it and they become customers as well. And this will rapidly take off in terms of a customer base. Um, or, less desirably, within an infectious disease context, as we have more people who are infective, it leads to more people getting infected, which leads to more infectives yet. And you could have a sudden increase, an explosion, and the number of people infected with cholera in a refugee camp, or the number of people infected with a sexually transmitted infection or with flu here on campus. Um, so you can have this very, this very negative, a, a very undesirable uh, feedback, a vicious cycle, as we might might call it. Um, and this sort of reinforcing feedback tends to lead to extremely rapid changes in the situation. It's kind of like this. Um, with this yardstick, if I didn't hold it, it would accelerate downwards faster and faster as its angle becomes steeper. Yes, question, all right. Yeah. Yeah, so, well, that indicates, so good question. So these, these um, loops here are a um, hint so that you, the viewer doesn't have to re-derive it themselves, that this is a positive feedback. This is positive because Let's take this one in the in the in the middle, okay? Um, if we have um, if we have some individual um, uh, we have some weight perceived as normal, um, that might influence the sort of weight for which I'm shooting and just kind of um, what I view is you know if I get concerned that I'm getting a bit overweight and I, I need to put more emphasis on working out or put more emphasis on eating more healthily, it might change my target weight. And that might lean, you know, my individual target weight will tend to lead to my being, you know, if that goes up, I will tend to be heavier. I probably should have added another link there to show that. And that will increase the mean weight in the population and that will increase weight perceived as normal. So this is trying to show a kind of hypothesis for why we see sudden rises in the amount of obesity. It's because people come to think of, of heavier weights as kind of normal. And, and as they become viewed as normal, people's weight tends to go up and then people tend to don't think of it as so extraordinary. And, and again, it can sort of creep, uh, creep its way up. Or similarly, if we have over here on the right-hand side, customers and word of mouth sales, this is indicating 
that it's a positive loop. Why is it positive? It's because this whole path from customers around and back to, back to customers is, is a positive net path. It's the same reasoning we went through just here a few min minutes ago, that fundamentally negatives cancel out. So if there's an even number of negatives along the path, then it's a net positive from A to C, right? Any two negatives will, will cancel out. Um, and simply, if you have two positives along here, it will be positive all along the way. And so by those same notions, this is a positive loop here. I could have put those in for these other three. These are all positive, um, positive These are all um, you know, cycles that are reinforcing. Okay, reinforcing. Because what does this mean here? It means a small change in customers can lead to more sales and therefore an even larger number of customers and an even larger change and it's reinforcing. And so we get this divergent behavior and um, it can lead to very sudden sort of accelerations of a change. Just like a small deviation from being vertical can lead to this, uh, to this yardstick um, falling faster and faster. Okay? Similarly, there'll be negative loops. Balance, these are balancing loops. These are the loops that keep in us in balance. The loops that keep us in homeostasis. The loops that keep us um, in a situation of stability. So, you know, one of the best is, okay, we make mistakes, we all make mistakes, and, and, and the, in a good situation, a healthy situation, that leads us to reflect and learn from our mistakes, which means fewer mistakes like that in the future. Right? Um, uh, same thing with hunger. We talked about hunger and food adjusting. You'll notice that the direction of these interior um, loops are in the direction in which we draw the, the arrows in the diagram, right? Um, so they just show that this loop is associated with a net balance. So in other words, it tends to damp out changes. So if you were to make, if you were to get a little bit more hungry, this, what this is saying is you'll tend to eat more and therefore you'll tend to bring yourself back into balance. So here, deviations end up being canceled out. It was exactly what our demonstrator so ably showed. That, you know, when you see this, you try to cancel out that deviation by moving this yardstick accordingly. Moving the yardstick, your finger at the bottom of the yardstick so that it's, it becomes closer to vertical, right? So that it, it gets back more into balance. That's exactly what we're doing here. Small deviations with a, with a properly operating negative feedback, small deviations get canceled out. The system comes, brings them back into balance put it another way, right? We grow thirsty, we take a drink of water, and it brings our system back into balance, or our body water system. Um, you know, uh, another thing that operates at a public health level is, you know, um, you perceive there to be quite a few people around you who are ill, say with flu. You have some higher perceived risk of illness, so that's a positive link there, right? If you're, if you're perception of the prevalence of, of illness goes up. You see more people around you sneezing, coughing. You have, you have a higher, compared to what it otherwise would have been, your perceived risk of illness is higher. Um, you'll therefore, all other things being equal, you'll therefore take more care. If you have an increase in the perceived risk of illness, all other things being equal, you take more care to avoid illness, right? Or this is the one we're following in the upper left here. And if you take greater care to avoid risk factors for illness, that will tend to lead the prevalence of illness to be lower. It'll sort of try to bring it, bring it back, um, back down. So this is a negative feedback operating on the spread of flu every year. People realize that there's a flu outbreak, and they wash their hands better, they engage in social distancing, um, come in less, less frequently, or what have you. Um, and, and therefore um, it, it's lower than it otherwise would have been in terms of the burden of illness. Um, you know, at a, at a policy level, we hope that, you know, people who, who are evaluating our policies will note policy effectiveness, will reevaluate policies that are not very effective, and will adapt them accordingly. So this too is a balancing loop where both these Links in the uh, are are have positive side and this is a negative side. Why is it negative or positive? What's the rule? Can anyone give me the rule? I alluded to it briefly. Can anyone give me a rule 
that, that will generally will specify the polarity associated with this internal loop based on the polarities associated with the outer loop of, the, of these links? What's the general rule? Yeah, so, so this will be negative if the, what, signs of these outer links are, if there's an odd number of negatives, it'll be negative. So in this case, there's one negative. Um, this is down the lower right. There's one negative, and so it's negative. Here, there's one negative, uh, so it's, it's negative. Here, there's, again, one negative, so it's negative. These ones on the previous slide, um, I guess these were all positives. Uh, there'll be some other cases where you'll have two negatives and they'll cancel. This is the same rule that we used just a few minutes ago for this sort of situation, right? It just so happens here A and C are the same variable. It's A, B, and B to A, right? And so it's just the negatives or pairs of negatives reverse each other. So if it's an odd number stretching from A to the last variable, it will tend to be a net negative influence, uh, ripple through to be a negative, uh, net negative, otherwise net positive. Um, does that make sense to people? Make sense? Okay. Um, so, you know, here are some factors. And, and of course, this one up here to the upper right is many of the things that save us, really, um, from infectious diseases. Um, it is true that, as on the previous slide, that as the number of infectives rises, the number of, of, of new infections will, will tend to rise, all other things being equal. But what balances that is the number of new infections goes up, the number of susceptibles will go down. Number of people who haven't gotten infected yet will go down. And, and because of that, you have a balancing situation because the more susceptibles there are, the more new infections there could be. If you have an increase in the number of new infections, it leads to a lower number of susceptibles. And therefore, and if this goes down, given that this is a plus, new infections will be lower. So it brings it back into balance. And this, ladies and gentlemen, is what stops infections from spreading. It's, it's what allows us to vaccinate a population and essentially stamp out an infection from being endemic. And it's ultimately what leads to the iPhone stopping to have penetration because there's not enough people around who, who are susceptible to the, to the you know, marketing image. Either they have one or they don't want one, and, and so therefore they don't have it. Okay, so um, I have some further comments on refinement, but I want to talk about how these things work together. Um, so uh, we can have diagrams which are built up of interacting loops or interacting variables. So down here in the lower right is a diagram that unites the two that we saw earlier in the two earlier slides, the plus and the minus. Right, just uh, check you on here. Um, this plus and the minus here. Um, so the number of infectives, new infections, and the number of susceptibles, okay? Um, so uh, here on the, uh, the causal loop side, we've knitted together um, two, uh, two sets of, of, of loops, where these loops, these loops uh, have, at the one hand, a positive feedback, and the other hand, a negative feedback, okay? So these are working in tandem, much as when I had this di this this um, this yardstick, there were two loops operating. One, a reinforcing loop having to do with the acceleration downward. One, a negative loop keeping it in balance. So here, we have a competing set of loops. Number of infectives um, tends to lead to more and more new infections. The number of susceptibles tends to limit those new infections. And this is why, ladies and gentlemen, when it comes to infectious diseases we see a takeoff of infection because this top loop is the most active. And we can actually measure this within system dynamic models, which is more dominant right now. This top one is dominant. And then at some point, this bottom one starts to be the limiting factor. And we have fewer and fewer new infections because of it. All it takes is depleting the number of susceptibles enough. Okay. Um, so we will often have diagrams which have pluses and minuses within them, and they'll be competing for their, 
for their results. Okay, um, and often will successively evolve the model to add in more and more factors. For example, we may start with this model, which is um, essentially just a re, uh, sort of a re um, hashing of, of what we just saw, a repositioning of it with a negative and the positive. And we may decide, okay, one of the things we also are going to have as a salient factor is waiting time. So the more new infections are, the more people are presenting for treatment. So if you need, if you need to be treated to overcome this particular illness, infectious illness, then that will lead to higher waiting times, and that may lead to higher numbers of contacts of susceptible to the infected. So if you're dealing with an infectious illness where, for example, people need to go wait in line um, to, to get treated, that may lead to higher waiting times and therefore higher contacts, and that may be yet another positive loop that drives the situation in an adverse way, that drives up the number of infectious individuals. Another thing you might see is more new infections, more people might present for vaccination, which leads to larger waiting times and therefore more contacts with, with infectives while people are waiting to be vaccinated, right? So you can get these extra loops added in that add, add to the behavior. Now, um, for all of these things, um, uh, for all of these things, uh, much of the motivation here for diagramming these things out is that each loop in a causal loop diagram is associated with dynamic behavior, okay? Each of these loops, it's not merely something pretty to look at, and we can have quite, quite large diagrams which come out of this that incidentally can be quite insightful as to kind of understanding which factors are some of the key factors linking several different components. But what's more, What's more substantial here is that each loop within a causal loop diagram is associated with a qualitative dynamic behavior, okay? And I've alluded to those, but I haven't shown them. Um, so uh, here are, are some of them um, uh, within this, uh, uh, within the examples we've seen. So one of them, for example, is this link between customers and word of mouth sales. And when we have a reinforcing loop like this, a loop with a positive sign, or something we call a positive feedback, we get divergent behavior. Behavior where a given change leads to a faster and faster acceleration of change along the way. So here the number of customers, for example, can rapidly escalate. Just as here, this divergent behavior was, behavior was associated with this yardstick. We have this yardstick, and that small deviation was accelerated, accelerated, accelerated to be faster and faster, more pronounced deviation. So here we have very rapid divergence, and the number of customers can grow very rapidly because of it. What else grows rapidly? In the sort of examples we've seen, what else can go grow rapidly in these situations? Can anyone tell me? What else, for the examples we've seen, um, where else do we see this sort of exponential growth? if we look at data. I actually showed an example last time of this particular phenomenon. But where else do we see this? Very rapidly changing for the worse. Well, it turns out the early phases of an epidemic, you see behavior exactly like this. In fact, it's so demonstrably exponential in its growth, you can measure a key variable that we'll be talking about in another lecture or two possibly three, um, called the basic reproductive number from that exponential growth. Okay. So this is leading to divergent behavior beca precisely because we see this sort of positive feedback here. And you can measure the rate of growth of this exponent because more and more people are getting infected. It goes from one person being infected to two, to four, to eight, to 16, to 32. 64, all those numbers we love as computer scientists, um, we, we see a very rapid growth. And that leads to this sort of divergence in behavior. Okay. So positive feedbacks, ladies and gentlemen, are associated with divergent growth. They're associated with instability. Okay? Instability. Um, a situation where a small change um, leads to a very rapid divergence. By contrast, ladies and gentlemen, negative feedbacks, 
balancing feedbacks are associated with stability. They're associated with a situation that tends to regain its state, its, its balance given a, a perturbance, given a disturbance, given a deviation. It tends to damp out that deviation. Mm -hmm. um, it tends to lead to some sort of uh, average, uh, average level. So hunger, you see that deviation, we eat and that restores our sort of balance of, of satiety. We, we feel thirsty, we drink some water, that restores our balance of bodily fluids. We make mistakes, we correct the mistakes, and the situation improves to a level we find tolerable. Policies are noted as ineffective, they're, they're improved, innovations are made, and they hopefully restore it to a pretty good state of affairs. That is the hallmark of, of negative feedbacks, and they tend to damp out the, um, the deviations from them. The, uh, there's action taken in the form of drinking that glass of water that will damp out a deviation in the original thirst. If you throw me into a desert, but I have a jug of water with me, I'll just tend to drink more water, and it will restore me to that normal level of, of sort of operating. Um, so these are robust systems. Systems with feedbacks are robust. Now that robustness, I, g I guess that's, that's putting a positive spin to it. They are stable. Now that stability may be desirable or undesirable sometimes. Often it's desirable. Often we, we, um, we, un we seek to make it stable. Occasionally it be undesirable because it keeps on, you know, poverty level stays frustratingly, st frustratingly high despite our best attempts to decrease it. Or, or the level of an endemic disease stays prevalent. Let's say gonorrhea in the province, it stays around, or syphilis. It stays around despite our best efforts. That, ladies and gentlemen, is often an indication of a negative feedback. I'll give an example of a very deleterious negative feedback that comes up with HIV AIDS. HIV AIDS, um, uh, you know, it, it, it's, it's exacted a devastating total uh, you know, or devastating health impact around the world, so cost impact as well, um, devastating human costs associated with it. Um, but there are there are many many attempts to to work at eliminating it. But there's some negative feedbacks in place. Um, so you put in place mechanisms. Well, the immune system has all these mechanisms to protect against it, but the bug mutates. TB, another example, um, uh, you, you attempt to stamp it out using very effective drugs, and what happens? You get drug-resistant TB, right? Here, it's resisting the deviation. You're, you're trying to wipe it out, but it resists it. There, there's a policy resistance, and that's associated with negative feedbacks. HIV AIDS, um, another one is, um, it, you know, early on, it led to dramatic changes in people's behavior to avoid HIV AIDS. Later, there was a lot of relaxation in, that, in those changes as people didn't perceive it as, as immediate a risk, and it led to larger number of infections again compared to what it otherwise would have been. So there's, when you have these negative feedbacks, it can lead to policy resistance. Now, a negative feedback with a delay associated with it leads to oscillation. Oscillations that, because it's kind of like uh, driving a car on ice for anyone who's had that experience. You start turning one way and you realize, oh, it's reacting wrongly, so I, I better adjust. But by that time, it's already headed that way, and so you weave sometimes. Same thing with going on a road. Um, you know, sometimes you over adjust, you're distracted, and you notice the car is going in the wrong you know, it's going off towards the shoulder, so you adjust, and you go too far, and it starts to go over the median line, and you have to bring it back. So when, when you have a delay, a delay associated with the mechanics of it, or the perception of it, etc., you can get these oscillations in place. And this is a very real phenomenon as well. You can get oscillations associated with hormonal systems, you can get oscillations associated with policy, oscillations associated with cycles of the economy, etc. Um, Another thing you see out of composing these is when you have two interacting feedbacks, 
you can get, in some cases, plateaus. Um, you know, a situation where you have some number of customers. In this case, the customers aren't recovering. They, you know, they stay customers once converted. You're depleting potential customers here. So the more customers there are, the more word of mouth sales, and that leads to more customers, but it also depletes potential customers, and that that has this impact on limiting the number of word of mouth sales. The more, the fewer potential customers there are, the fewer word of mouth sales you're going to be able to have. And so here, the number of customers rises quickly, which is the dominant loop as it's rising quickly. If you see this acceleration going quicker and quicker early on, which is the dominant loop here? It's a positive feedback. It's this one here. And then it starts to plateau off. And this looks more like the balancing behavior you see associated with a negative loop. And it sort of goes off to, to this asymptote, which where essentially all the susceptible population is, is, um, is captured. And you see these sort of things. You see um, uh, gross like plateaus. But when people can recover, when it's not just a permanent customer, but someone who can recover to a state where they're immune to being sold it again, you get oscillations in a big way. You can get sort of declines and then a buildup of individuals who are customers who are susceptibles and then it can take off again and decline. And we're going to talk about this quite uh, quite a lot. And you see these um, see these a lot. Okay. Um, so I've spoken a little bit about policy resistance um, and some of these factors combine to yield counterintuitive behavior. Often the interactions of these feedbacks are quite complex. Um, there's snowballing effects. When things go bad, they go bad really, really quickly. We talked about software projects. That's the case. But it's the case with outbreak of pandemic flu, or it's the case of you know outbreak of an STI or, or, or HIV AIDS among our intravenous drug use community. Um, and it can lead to policy resistance, situations where things can be resistant to change. You know, you want to stamp out flu, you take every effort against it. If, if people get relaxed because they don't see flu around them, or if about measles and mumps, people get relaxed and they don't vaccinate their kids because they say, well, we've never heard of any case of measles. Have you ever heard of a case of measles? No, I haven't heard of a case of measles. Well, why do we vaccinate our kids then? That's when you start seeing measles outbreaks again. That's when you start seeing mumps outbreaks again. Similarly with fires, if people get really, really lax, say, well, why do we need these fire signatures at all? We haven't seen a fire in a long time. Start getting lax about it, have no training, et cetera, that's when the risks of fires blow up. So policy resistance often comes about not just due to the character of the physical system, but because of people's behavior and perceptions of the situation. We are part of these systems often. And our own actions and our own predispositions and our own sort of uh, reactions to information shapes, ladies and gentlemen, often the behavior of the system. So we're dealing here with socio-technical systems. Systems where people are part of it and other things like pathogens and technologies, et cetera, are part of it. And ladies and gentlemen, those of you from computer science background, who have no interest, who only want to work on the back end of computer systems. If there's anyone here in this room who wants to do that, you, you want to work on the back office side, don't want any contact with customers and so on, you still have to worry about this sort of stuff. Um, some of the worst disasters in computer history, well, worst disasters in logistics, et cetera, have come because of failure to consider the fact that people are part of the system. Um, and it's not adequate to simply blame people and say, well, they're dumb users. Um, you know, uh, your system will amount to nothing if it can't be used effectively. And you have to proactively be thinking about the role people will play with, within that system. So this policy resistance comes up in a big way in public health and other areas, but it also comes up you know, all throughout, um, throughout our lives as actors in the world. Um, and there's a number of ways in which you know, policy in, in the health areas run afoul of, uh, of this sort of policy resistance. Um, okay, um, I think uh, I'm going to stop here. I think we've, uh, we've gone uh, far enough for today um, in discussing causal loop diagrams. I want to give just a little bit of a hint as to um, what we'll be seeing next time. So 
what I'm going to do is to just um, call up one thing here and it's on the stock and flow area and I'm going to call this up and in hopes that um, that we can have our our others uh, see this as well um, I am going to do start sharing again and let's go down to to this PowerPoint show okay and um, yeah this is um, uh, we are again seeing this um, the situation um, where I'm not sure if they're, they're able to see this. Um, I'll have to check with them. Um, okay, but uh, we talked about feedbacks driving infectious disease dynamics. Folks, I'm just look at the, the first few slides from, from, the, um, uh, from the stock and flow lecture here. I'm gonna send it to you right now on the, on the uh, window here in case you'd like to, uh, in case you can't see it as we follow along. So here are stocks and flows. Um, Okay, for those who are falling from a distance, uh, this file is on its way to you. Um, it should be available for upload in about um, five seconds or something like that. Okay, you should be able to download it now, stocks and flows. Okay, okay, um, there we go. Okay, so um, one thing we'll see is that once we capture these stocks and flows in a, in a diagram, you, in a, a simulation model, what you'll be able to see is, is qu at a quantitative level some of these phenomena we've just been talking about. Um, you'll be able to see uh, very rapid growth um, here in the number of, of uh, individuals who are infected and sort of a turnaround. And we'll be explaining these things, but to do so effectively and to talk about when different loops are dominant within this within this set of three, loop, of three loops here, susceptibles, infectives, and here having recoveries. To talk about when different parts of these loops are dominant, we have to build a, um, a model and uh, a quantitative model. And we're going to do that using models like this. These are called stock and flow models, okay? Um, they are isomorphic to, they are actually visual representations of ordinary differential equations. So we have susceptibles, infectious individuals, and, and temporarily immune, and maybe some variable accumulating cumulative illness or cumulative cost, for example. And we're gonna build up a model looking just like this, where each of these variables has some dependence on the others, and these stocks are accumulations. They're accumulations over time of the flows in and the flows out, okay? Um, for those of you who are familiar with the applied math associated, these are the state variables. This is the x and the dx, dy. And these are all new recoveries and new infections are all part of the, the derivative of that. The thing on the right-hand side of dx, dt equals y. That's, that's all over there. It's a combination of these new infections and new recoveries. So we're gonna be seeing how we build up these things to characterize the situation. In this case, we have the population divided into to three categories, and then we're accumulating cumulative illnesses down here. These variables up here are called auxiliary variables, and they're going to be based, just as when we put together a spreadsheet, we could say this cell equals the sum of these other three. This, this variable will be the sum of susceptible, infected, and recovered, and that will be the total population, okay? And there'll be formulas associated, ladies and gentlemen, formulas not only associated with these auxiliary variables, but associated with these flows, these kind of pipes between these things that say just how many people per unit time, for example, are recovering. What's the rate of recovery, the number of people per day who are recovering, or the, num the rate of new infections, or the rate of people losing immunity in going back to a susceptible state from an immune state. So we'll be building up these sort of models and we'll see that um, they have some very particular dynamics associated that's induced because of their structure. And we'll see how they can be merged with the sort of causal loop diagrams we're talking about. And in fact, how within these models, there are these loops that we talked about and depicted in a causal loop diagram. So in short, we will go from a situation where we have these sort of causal loop diagrams to a situation where we have a stock and flow model which can be run and can yield, can yield output such as this. Okay. 
output such as this, which operationalizes in a precise simulation way um, the results of a, of, of a uh, model, of our assumptions about those causal loops. And those causal loops will work hand in hand with understanding of the stocks and flows to inform our understanding of these phenomena. And one of the things you'll see is that if you come to this with an understanding of the stocks and flows and their basic dynamics, you can actually have a much richer intuitive understanding for why you see a lot of patterns. It's not merely numbers spat out and for some unknown reason. There's a story behind it. In the stocks and flows and the causal loops will help you tease out that story, help you understand why you see these things and how they would be different, ladies and gentlemen, if you were, as we did with this yardstick at the beginning of lecture, to go from having no, just one sort of uh, feedback to having two feedbacks. In other words, if you were to change the system by adding information feedbacks or changing, changing the ways in which people react to the system, the healthcare system reacts, how would it change the behavior? That's what we'll be able to do. And our understanding of stocks and flows at an intuitive level will aid in that process, okay? Okay, so that's all uh, for today. Um, I am going to release um, by this weekend the first exercise to do within Vensim using these things. I'd like you to be sure to have downloaded Vensim by the next meeting so we can do a little bit of futzing in class with it, okay? And we can build up a sort of simple model of the sort that we've seen, okay? Yeah, um, in fact, I think that was in the syllabus. I think each of the dates was listed, but if, if it's not, I'll make sure that that's there. And in fact, um, per my comments to you earlier, Molly, I'm hoping by this weekend to have a, uh, a lecture by lecture blow of what I'm covering on what day for the class and similarly for the, um, uh, for the assignment. So it, are the assignments, are the dates given there? Uh, no. The date, okay, it, it says what they are, but yeah. not the dates, okay. I'll, I'll add the dates. Okay. Okay, any other questions right now? Questions from our remote uh, remote audience here. Huh? Oh, okay, good, good. Um, so uh, another point of note is I've been uploading the slides. I've, I've, I need to upload the slides before lecture so that those who are in class can follow along as well and as well uh, some of those from remote. So I'll, I'll see if I can make a habit of doing that. Um, and uh, there's some other things that I need to sort out for our remote people as far as uh, uh, obtaining some of the materials that I'm, I'm working on. I've had some conversations earlier today. Um, I'd urge you all to go to the uh, project's description. I did change it today to add a project, a project that Riley has proposed here. Um, which is some really interesting work involving flu. And I think what I'll do next time, there's a couple people in the room, Molly, Riley, and I think maybe one other person um, who had some ideas for projects, okay? Um, and I think what I'll do is give a little bit of time for people to talk a little bit about a project idea. So if you're seeking someone to work with you on a project, let me know. And I think I'll feature for a couple minutes each person. They could give a bit of a spiel about why it might make an interesting project to work together and uh, what they can bring to the table, that sort of stuff, okay? Because we do have some really, really interesting projects. Take a look at that document. You'll see some, um, some of those that are proposed. There's quite a number now. Okay, that's all for today. Thanks, sir. Thanks for everyone. Uh, I'm behind on, on, on surveying people for that. Um, so far, so far it's looking unlikely that it will change. Okay. Yeah. Appreciate it. Yeah. Um, working with any logic, it takes like 15 minutes to start on my computer. Is that normal? No, that's not normal. Okay. Any idea why that might be the case? Um, uh, you're not, you're not noticing that with respect to any other, um, any other software. So this, the yes. question for those who didn't hear it was, any logic is taking a very long time to start on one of the students' computers. Um, are there other software that also take long or no? Um, no, I've never had this experience on this computer. It's actually fairly new and fairly fast in terms of modeling uh, the most recent version of Windows. 
Oh, okay. And um, did this only start recently, or did this start during the boot camp as well? Um, I didn't use my laptop. Before. Got it. Um, okay. Can you? Uh, so when it's starting up, what do you? What's going on in the background? Like, if you look at the tasks that are running, what's taking the most time? Um, the, the only other thing I have at startup is Steam. I mean, that doesn't take up any resources at all. No. Um, um, uh, is this is this Linux Windows? This is Windows. Okay. Can you? Is there any way that would be blocked by like a firewall program? Or no, no, because I know it sometimes does run with firewalls just fine. I don't think so. Um, dumb, dumb question. You're not running anything with special with Eclipse or anything like that because it's Eclipse based. No, nothing of the sort. Okay. Um, I would look at what tasks are taking the most CPU time. Really that. Uh, I would I'd also be tempted to say, just as a wild I idea, maybe you could try it in safe mode just to see if, if it's that much faster. That will give you some hint that there's something being disabled there. Okay. Um, but um, I'd like to get to the root of this, and I'll, I'd be glad to, to work with you on this uh, to see if we could figure out what it is. Um, Got me perplexed because I've never seen that happen before. Um, I was looking online, it looks like a couple other people had problems with it, but they didn't find solutions either. So I'm just worried about that one. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm also wondering if it could be some weird interaction with the Java installed or something like that. That could be. Yeah, but. Uh, we'll have to see. No. Um, well, I guess we'll, we can take a look at it another time. I'll see if yeah. I can figure anything out. Uh, the other question, I guess the other question is yeah. related to class. Sure. Yes. Is 